Hello world and welcome to this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Masera, and today we're going to be taking a look at Spring Apps on Azure for a part in our multi-part series on this particular offering. Hi guys, today we're gonna to be taking a look at Azure Spring Apps. Now this is an interesting offering on Azure that provides a bunch of the needed services for running Spring-based applications in Azure. So we're gonna be doing a couple of videos on this, but today I just wanna look at some of the components of this particular framework and then deploy an application to it just to show you what that workflow typically might look like. If you're watching this, I'm going to assume that you already know something about the Spring framework. I'm not gonna be going into details about the code that I'm going to be writing that is gonna be running on this. I'm mostly gonna be looking at the Azure side of this and how you can use this in your code, although we might look at some code samples along the way. So Spring Apps on Azure Azure starts with a cluster and the cluster is basically a set of resources that you can use for your apps. Now each tier, there's three of them, have different amounts of CPU and RAM and so on that you can use among the apps that you deploy to this cluster. Now each app will then have a set of deployments. So uh, a single cluster can have multiple apps and an app can have multiple deployments. So a deployment is essentially a production deployment and then maybe a test deployment if you want to think of it in those terms. And this allows you to deploy an app deploy new code to your app and still have an instance of that running with an older version. And when you're ready, then you can swap those out and then have your production deployment consuming the resources and re consuming the re requests as the new code comes online. So the deployments allows you to have the ability to have like AB deployments or green blue deployments or things like that, depending on what scenario you might be using in your application. Now, a deployment can have multiple instances of the application running. So an instance is basically uh, one copy of the application executable running in memory. So you can scale these out by adding numbers of instances to the application deployment. So if I need to consume more traffic that's coming in off an HTTP request, I can add more instances of my application to my deployment and that will allow me to scale out in this regard. You can also scale up by allocating new, uh, more resources to a given deployment or given application if you need to do that as well. Now, within the context of a cluster, it provides two standard services that are very common to Spring-based applications. And the first of those is a config server. Now the config server basically is used for configuration data. And the way that works is you have an external repository that has a bunch of YAML files as a part of that repository. You configure the config server to go out and get the config settings from that repository. It pulls those in and then it basically creates an in-memory database with those settings. And so when a new application comes online or rather a deployment comes online, it will go to the config server to get the config data about the application. That could be things like connection strings for databases or external services that you might need to connect to or other things like that so that it can know how to configure itself once the application starts up. That's not something that you want to pass with the application. You just basically have a well-known host for the config server and then all of the other config data Data is going to be on that config server and that's where you want to get it from. And the other part of this uh, cluster that is very common with Spring Apps is a service discovery. And that's typically Eureka in the context of Spring Apps. But the service discovery basically works by allowing a deployment or an application to register itself with the service discovery. And that way, whenever another app needs to know where to find an instance of the application, it will go to the discovery service and the discovery service will return an endpoint that this application can then use to request resources from, say, uh, an internal service that it needs to send email from. It can do that simply by going to the this, this, this service discovery, getting back that endpoint, and then it will call that from within itself 
to that, make a direct call over uh, a common channel, typically HTTP, to this to this other uh, service that's running in the cluster, and then it will be able to uh, talk to that service and then be able to tap into that functionality that's embedded in that service. So this is a very common pattern that is used in microservice architecture as well. But the Spring uh, apps on Azure provides these two as part of the deployment. So it's not something that you have to create or maintain. You just basically have to know where those endpoints are in the context of the cluster. And then you can reach out to the config server to get config data or reach out to the service discovery um, this, uh, to get endpoints for other services. And we'll be looking at these in more detail as we go through uh, the, the video series on Spring apps and Azure. And another thing that you can configure in Spring Apps that's kind of built into the context of Spring Apps, but it kind of resides outside of, of Spring Apps, is persistent storage. And it uses Azure sto uh, file storage or uh, storage accounts to basically persist data if you need something other than like other than something like a database uh, for persistence. So what this allows us to do is configure an external data store, which is a file service. And what that will do is allow us to take whatever is in this persistent storage and mount it inside of the application as part of the file system so that the application can read and write data from that file system level call, but it's going to be hosted and stored outside of the cluster on an Azure storage account so that you can read that data in and write that data out. And you can also set um, permissions to that and other things with that uh, deployment. But basically that gives you the ability to have the uh, persistent storage. So in the event that your application shut, shuts down, uh, you uh, can bring it back up and the data that you wrote to that will still be around. Or if you scale up new uh, copies or new instances of that deployment, uh, you will all be able to write and read from that persistent storage as as well. So for a demo, I basically want to run an application on Spring Apps on Azure. So to do that, I'm going to be running this code that we see here. This is just a simple application that does an API. And then the API just increments every time I call into that API. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a kind of a hello world application that is going to be a Spring Boot application. Show you what it looks like. It's pretty simple. I'm going to start it up here. And the uh, server started on port uh, 99, uh, 9090. So if I come over here and I launch um, my um, browser here and I go to localhost and I go 9090, I should be able to get a greeting here that says hello from Azure. And so that is what I'm going to be calling into when I deploy this to Azure. So the application, again, is pretty straightforward, nothing fancy here. You can use whatever IDE you want to write Spring Apps. I'm using Eclipse with STS tools. You could use IntelliJ, uh, VS Code. You could just do it on the command line, whatever you're comfortable with. That's really not the point. But I do want to show you the Azure CLI to deploy this particular application into Azure. So to create Spring Apps, it's pretty straightforward in the portal. You can come over here to create resource and just type in Spring Apps and uh, search for that. And you'll see Azure Spring Apps from uh, right here for Azure. And from this, you can then create, click create, and you can walk through the wizard. Now, again, this is really uh, pretty straightforward. You can integrate with uh, a VNet and you can also select the tier here, which is uh, the basic options right here. And you can configure some logging and things like that. But I do want to show you the tiers that are available here. I did mention basic standard and enterprise. Um, basic is uh, the one that you, you would use for dev tests. It's pretty straightforward. You can have up to 25 instances of an app and then you can have uh, one one v uh, CPU and two gigs of RAM per per instance, and then you can have uh, two v CPUs and four gigs that come with this. And then the standard tier is a little bit uh, more, and this is a, a production oriented tier right here. And then enterprise, which integrates with uh, VMware right there. So again, three different tiers that you can choose from here. It's not as fine tuned as you can do with other services, but it does give you some uh, tiers that you can use for various applications, depending on what you're trying to do here. So once you have that configured, uh, you can then uh, create this resource and you can just start to deploy things to it. I already have one created, so I'm going to show you what mine looks like. And this one is using the dev test tier, and which is fine for my demos here. So I, as I mentioned, you can configure, uh, you have the config server uh, right here that allows you to configure the paths for the 
uh, repositories where the settings might reside. So that would be your GitHub repo or some other kind of source code repository where you're going to be loading settings from. And this can be configured to read that data. Now, this doesn't allow you to see the uh, config, the actual service discovery because that's just built into the platform. There's nothing you need to configure there. So anytime you deploy something to the application, uh, the application framework here, it's going to have the ability to register with the service discovery that's built into the platform. It does have the ability to integrate with VNets, and then you can also see what the outbound IP address is for this. So if you want to integrate it with things like firewalls and so on, you can do that. And you have the storage configuration right here where you can configure persistent storage, which we'll, we'll talk about that in a future video. And you can also do things like custom certificates and custom domains and other things like that for applications as well. But the main thing in this is the apps that we're going to be looking at today. So... In this particular uh, uh, instance, I can configure different application frameworks for this particular app right here. And to do that, what I can do is create an app. Now, with this out of the box, it allows me to deploy um, different kinds of resources into this. So if I, if I look at this drop down here, I see that I have the ability to deploy artifacts that basically that would be uh, jar files that are configured for Java where you can deploy .NET Core applications to this as well. And you can also select the runtime right here. So it supports Java 8, 11, 17, and .NET Core uh, 3.1 out of the box. And then this is where you can configure the uh, profile for the resources that you need to run the particular application that you're going to be deploying to this. Uh, this one doesn't deploy, uh, doesn't do deployments, uh, more than one deployments per application. You can only do one deployment per application, but the other tiers would allow us to do that. So I'm basically going to have a single deployment per application in the dev test here. But this one allows me to at least configure uh, some aspects of the application that I'm going to be working with. So my app, I'm going to call it app two that I'm going to deploy to. I've already got one called app one. And um, I can also create this on the CLI if I want to do that as well. And I'm going to be deploying a Java application. We'll look at containers in another video, uh, but that's an interesting use case because Spring does work well with containers. And I'm going to be using Java 11. And then the, the defaults here are just fine. If we want to stick with that, I'm going to continue to just use the defaults otherwise. So once I have that, I can click create, and this is going to deploy a new app into my um, Azure Spring Apps uh, cluster right here. And this could take a few minutes to actually deploy it, but once it's up and running, I can then do a deployment to it. You can also create these on the CLI, which I'll show you how to do that too. So I'm in a terminal here and I'm going to use the AZ CLI to deploy with. Now this is pretty straightforward to do it with the AZ CLI, but you can also integrate this with uh, CI CD pipelines if you want to do that and what, what have you. But um, I'm going to be deploying a particular jar file that I've already built right here. And this is the jar file that I'm going to be deploying into Azure. So depending on how you build this, if you use Gradle or Maven or whatever uh, utility you want to use to build your application with, you're going to have an output that's a jar file. And that contains everything I need to run this in that particular jar file. Now, um, to create an app first, I need to use the CLI or the Azure portal. Uh, to create this, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a command that you use with the Azure CLI. So you do AZ, uh, then you would do spring app, and then you type in create. Now, this is gonna show you an example of how you might do this. Now, the actual uh, parameters that are required are the resource group, the, the service name, or the, uh, which is the cluster name, and then the, the name of the app that you're gonna be uh, uh, creating there. But I want to assign an endpoint. That basically gives me an endpoint URL that I can hit, and then you can configure the, the, the CPU reservations and memory and the instance count that you want to use for this. So I'm just going to copy this right here and then just configure it on the, the CLI using this command. And so I'm going to give it a single instance, a single CPU and one gig of RAM, which should be more than enough to run uh, this. I want to assign a endpoint to this. My resource group, I'm going to grab that from the portal which is right here, which also happens to be the name of my app as well, my app, my cluster name, which is going to be my service name, sorry. My, that's gonna be my uh, cluster name right here. And uh, then my app, I'm gonna call it, instead of my app, I'm gonna call it app three right here. And um, 
and then that will just create a new instance of the application that's going to be running. Uh, and this can take a few minutes to do depending on how uh, fast Azure is running at the time that you do this. And I'm also running in a dev test uh, cluster. So this is going to take a little bit longer than what you would get out of a standard or a premium tier, but we'll come back when this is finished. So now that my application is now running on my app instance that I have created, uh, I can see that I have a couple of things here. It's based all the output from this is just, you know, JSON data about what uh, it deployed from Azure. But if I uh, tab over to this particular app on Azure, you can see that I, I pulled it up already. Uh, but if I come back over here to look at my apps, you can see that I'm running Java 8. That's just the def default. Now I could change that to Java 11, but uh, Java 8 should be fine for this one. Uh, there's nothing particular about this one that requires a newer version of Java than what I'm currently using. And so you can see here is the profile I assigned it. I have uh, one vCPU, one gig of memory, which should be fine for this. And this is some of the things I can do with it, like such as custom domains and SSL, uh, those kinds of things. And that can scale up, scale out, and then I can have configuration data, et cetera, associated with this. And in future videos, we're gonna look at some of the stuff related to configuration, as well as looking at service discovery and persistence. But today we're just kind of gonna look at this app on, on Azure now that I've deployed it. Now, I don't have anything in the root, so I'm gonna get an error page right here, which I kind of expected that, but um, I'm going to go to the the path that I have for this app called greeting. If I go uh, enter on that, I can see that I have hello from Azure, and if I just refresh that, it's just incrementing the ID for each request that I'm pushing into this. So again, the app's up and running. I deployed that locally, then I built the jar file and then put it on Azure into Azure uh, Spring app. So again, it's very versatile platform. We'll be looking at more features of it in future videos. If you like this content, please consider visiting us online at www.wintelect.com and there you can find about services that Wintelect offers, including training and consulting services. Also, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to get notifications when new content becomes available and also comment down below. You can also follow me on Twitter at the one mule and also follow Wintelect on Twitter at Wintelect now or at Wintelect. We are constantly posting things about Azure related technologies and things related to software development. You can also reach us by email at consulting at Until next time, thank you.